Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Professor's Lab. You have a couple more questions, and I have a couple more answers, so let's get right down to it. Lots of these are from the Discord, so we're just gonna, we're just gonna fire them away. Here we go. Samurai Sam, you asked if you could see some of the stuff that we have behind the new DM screen, because as you know, we've We've made some upgrades from the the baseline. Um, as for what is new on the back, we can put some of this stuff up on the screen, but the general gist of it is we have a type chart of all the Pokemon types so that I don't forget anything in the heat of the moment. Um, I have skills and abilities, same as would be on the, the normal DM screen. Uh, things like cover and travel pace, all that fun stuff. The biggest difference is going to be the conditions panel that I have over here that has all of the various homebrew methods of all the status effects that you can have in Pokemon as well as all the normal ones that occur in D&D traditionally and then I have the players proficiencies and modifiers written down and there's also just a big map of the region so that I don't forget where everybody is uh, even if I forget which way is north on a map that I created it's always helpful Moving on, D-Swag, you asked a couple questions. You asked, when the players get to voice their own Pokemon, do I change the Pokemon's personality based on how the trainers voice them, or do I keep them close to what they were before? Um, the short answer is no. I do not change anything about the Pokemon before or after they get voiced by the players. My hope and the usual outcome is that there is a lot of give and take the players have a pretty good idea of how their Pokemon would react in a situation, and they try to stick to that for the most part, and I do like to reward them when they do, because I feel like it's a lot more fun, but at the end of the day, it is still in that moment. It is their character. It is what they are doing, so they do get the final say. Um, I can have an idea of what their Pokemon might do, and I might ask some leading questions, but at the end of the day, I'm not going to force them to do something that they're not comfortable with. You also asked if gyms have signs or anything that says if a gym is quote-unquote fish-friendly. Um, no. Gyms allow any and all challengers um, with no questions asked. So if a trainer wants to bring a water-type Pokemon that cannot function on land into a fire gym, I, I hope that you have a solution in mind for your partner already as part of your training. That is kind of the accepted and expected rules of engagement when you are going into a gym you are fighting them on their terms new boy you asked what happened in the off-camera training sessions that we've alluded to a couple times um it was a lot of just freeform team combats it was really loosey-goosey we didn't record anything it was a battle map everybody was some dice Basically, we just ate cookies, and I had the players kind of battle each other a few times to see uh, what was working, what wasn't, what they liked about their Pokemon, what they didn't. We'd been playing long enough that I felt like they would have a grasp on anything that they might want to change. Um, so we made a lot of adjustments to uh, bonuses to hit, uh, how much damage something could do, what effects it might have. Um, but as for like what the actual combats were, it was really just Slurp using a roll speed. Uh, Nipsey trying to hit him with spores, and then Violet just destroying everyone else. Um, but the purpose of it was immediately following the evolution. We wanted to make sure that everybody was scaling appropriately and that nobody was really far behind. And if they were, we, we did some on-the-fly level-ups and tweaking. Um, you also asked a bunch of questions on the Pokeball mechanics, and we've... I've addressed it a couple times, but without being dismissive, don't worry too much about the specifics of the Pokeball mechanics. They are much more a personal agreement between me and the players than they are a game mechanic. We don't want to have four players running around with six team members that are in Pokeballs and two or three that aren't, and then they all have interactions and reactions because then inevitably one or two things are going to be important in those interactions, and everyone else is just going to kind of be there. So they're not really adding to anything, um, which conversely is why when Milo sends Monty away to deliver mail, or if someone's out on a scouting mission, I don't force them to be down a partner, because that also limits what kind of encounters I could do, 
Um, it might make things much more dangerous for all sides of the, the screen. So if I put something out, it's supposed to be relatively simple and Monty's gone and, and Joel's rocking a, a smaller squad, he's getting less actions in combat. It's not as fun. It won't be as engaging. Um, but the, the easiest way that I can describe how the Pokeball mechanics work and why they're different all the time is a lot of the times I will forget what mechanics we've already used and, and why. But at the end of the day, as long as everybody's having fun and things keep moving, that is the intention of the Pokeball mechanics and their, their limitations. Jumping back into it. Thank you, Shot, for clarifying how to say your name so that I can answer your question. You asked how I handle shiny Pokemon. Do I have a chart that I go off of? Um, or it's like how or why is it special? A little bit of the process. Um, shiny Pokemon are kind of in the same vein as the different forms of Pokemon. I like the idea that if a Pokemon were to be shiny, it's probably some sort of genetic mutation. Um, so why would every shiny Pokemon look the same? Um, so I like to kind of switch things up, change them around, rather than just have, you know, like you find a, a shiny Hop-Up and it's always the same over and over and over again. Um, but as for when they show up or why, a lot of it is avoiding stagnation on on my behalf. Um, encounter design, it's, you, get, you can get kind of bogged down if you do a whole bunch of it all at once. So rather than trying to come up with dozens and dozens of random encounters and combats and stuff, sometimes the easiest thing to do is just, you know, throw a, throw a shiny Yanma out and see what the team does. Um, they might get super excited and try to catch it. They might just interact with it, send it on its way. Um, but kind of tag team off that i'm gonna go on a little bit of a ramble may or may not be interesting to you guys but i handle shinies in the same way i handle like a quote-unquote regional variant um so it's i use the shinies in these variants to if there if there's been a lot of normal encounters and interactions going on or there's like nothing's really kicking off the session feels a little bit like stale air the best way to spice it up is just throw something at the players that's weird and off the wall and kind of bananas. So I, I do like to throw shinies in there every now and again. Uh, the examples that you've brought up have been uh, Evanrude and Dial-Up. Uh, Dial-Up was just funny to me because I liked the idea of like an older model Magnemite that just like had no, no color at all. It was just very kind of washed out, maybe a little bit rusted, struggling to keep up with changing technologies and how would he function and that to me was a more fun encounter and then it just so happens that that is also the shiny palette um so that worked out relatively well for us um but it's i also use them if the players are relying really really heavily on their knowledge instead of the character knowledge i love throwing just weird stuff at them like ratataz with the plague and then they go from okay this is easy we'll just actually stomp them and like we'll fight the rats to like oh yeah no there's actual stakes now um so changing up typings and stuff is a lot of fun um because the whole thing is homebrew so it's kind of fun to just throw something really weird at them like inverting types is is a it's a nice way to nice way to change things up anyways that's enough rambling um we got asked by a bunch of different people at a bunch of different times now that we've had some evolutions. How do I sort of rule on them? The evolutions so far are much more based on the the bond between the trainer and the Pokemon than they are XP. Um, and the actual evolution I like to lean into with narrative and stakes more than anything else. Um, I don't Traditionally, if I'm running a normal D&D campaign, I do not like the idea of combat as the only means of gaining XP. With Pokemon, that is literally the only means of gaining XP. So I don't gate the evolutions to an experience level or some kind of level scaling that they need. So two Totodiles with two different trainers would not evolve at the same 
rate or time if they were both doing the same things. It's all about how those trainers are interacting with their Pokemon, how close they are, how invested they are. If somebody gets into a situation where there's a lot of emotional stakes as well as physical, um, you might see an evolution. Um, but I don't like to get more specific than that because I don't want to lock anything into a box. But as for Pokemon that evolve with trade or item things, um, I'm not opposed to allowing them to evolve. Like if you were to find like an Eevee and give it a one of the elemental stones and get like a really low level Flareon, um, it's not just going to be some crazy power spike. Like if you do it really early, it might just be sort of awkward for all involved parties if you rush the evolution process. So rather than working in where they're going to be and you just all of a sudden, I'm going to use Eevee as an example because it, it's we're relatively well known. But basically if you have an Eevee and you give it a Firestone, you get a Flareon. In the campaign, I would look at that as if you had like a really low level Eevee and you gave it a Firestone with no prior training, it might just start lighting things on fire on accident. Like it might not be used to its own heat. It might try to cool itself off and just be very confused and kind of alarmed if the trainer just goes, hey, by the way, you're a Flareon now. Um, whereas if they kind of work over time and say, hey, this is kind of what we're moving towards, if they involve the Eevee in the process um, as they kind of progress through their travels and then they happen upon a Firestone, then they could maybe work towards some fire moves before they actually go through with the evolution process and it might be a little bit easier um, on both sides because I always think it's kind of strange in the in the games and the show where, you know, Pokemon just comes out, they bop it with a stone and all of a sudden it's a new species. I feel like that would be a little bit jarring if you were the Pokemon. And you might... You know, if you have a bunch more physical strength now, you might try to, you know, open a door or, like, move something. You might just shatter it. Um, so that's that's kind of how I see the item evolutions. As for the trade ones, I mean, I, I find that kind of a weird mechanic. It sort of was encouraged to get both versions or know somebody who had the other one. So I don't really see the need for that, but it could be, could be worked with. Um, but... The short answer on trade evolutions is I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. This is sort of the most I've ever uh, put thought into that. Now, before I leave you, I have but one more question for you fine folks at home. Who dat thing? Hopefully some of you can figure out who dat thing. But in the meantime, I want to thank you all for watching this and everything. I want to thank you all for your questions. Specifically, those of you in the Discord, you guys have some, you guys have some nasty little questions, and sometimes I can answer them, and sometimes I can't. But if you are not a part of the Discord and you would like to be, check out the Patreon link in the description box for this video, and you can join the discussion in there. Uh, there's also a tier in the Patreon where you can watch our post shows. So after the sessions wrap up, where I and the players all sit around the table and kind of talk about what just happened. And uh, if that sounds like your jam, check that out. And if, if not, thanks for watching all the same, and we'll catch you in the next thing. Farewell. <laughs>